Returning now for the second half of the Merry Prankster's visit to the Levity Zone, we feature prankster Lee Kornstrom reading from his autobiography, When I Was a Dynamiter, or How a Nice Catholic Boy Became a Merry Prankster, a Pornographer, and a Bridegroom Seven Times. I've recorded this reading at Bookshop Santa Cruz, sitting next to a line of Lee's fellow pranksters that night in December 2015. In front of me was displayed the original sign from the Hip Pocket Bookstore, the progenitor to the current beloved bookshop and one of the counterculture's first beachheads in Santa Cruz in 1964. As a historian of this period, I have befriended and interviewed many surviving members of this group, working with mathematician Ralph Abraham on the Hip Santa Cruz History Project, a storytelling circle and archive. This has added tremendously to my own archival collections of Dr. Timothy Leary and the late Terence McKenna. I personally knew Hip Pocket Bookstore co-founder Peter Demma, as well as his old friend Leon Tabori, who is mentioned in Tom Wolfe's novel The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. Peter and Leon left us several years ago, but I recall fondly as Leon recounted how he was at Ken Kesey's place in La Honda the day that the famous bus Further was painted. More on that after we hear a selection of spirited readings by Lee. The title of the book was When I Was a Dynamiter. All right, and he'll explain that. But the subtitle is How a Nice Catholic Boy Became a Merry Prankster, a Pornographer, and a bridegroom seven times. Now, I think Wallace Bain noted that that's, he's, that he's the only one who could have a subtitle like that, Lee. <laughs> but what I want to say to you is, Lee, seven is your lucky number. Lee, please, a huge round of applause for Lee Clark. <laughs> the first thing I noticed walking in here tonight is that they used to tell us that LSD would be bad for us and it would uh, drive us crazy and we'd all be uh, sick and with us. They were right. <laughs> um, I want to acknowledge uh, my fellow Mary Christers in the front row of George Walker, Ken Babs, Roy Seaburn, Mountain Girl, Julius Carpin. <laughs> about these kind of pants that don't have a zipper. You can just open it up and... Where do you get those? Uh, I bought them in a Goodwill. So. I've got my own. But it's something worth looking at, into. Uh, this book took me about a year and a half to write, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a few selections out of this book. And uh, I'm going to read about a busted Kesey's place. Oh. Exhausted by several days of prankster foolishness, we were calling space travel. This is up in La Honda in the mountains of San Mateo County. Great place. Great place, yeah. Several days of prankster foolishness, we were calling space travel. I was napping one pleasant spring evening in a back bedroom at Kesey's La Honda rustic house in the forested mountains above Palo Alto when I heard Michael Hagen's voice shouting something about a search warrant. Search warrant? We'd been expecting something from the cops who'd been milling around the Honda, but I was in no mood to stick around to see what this particular search warrant business was all about. It sounded like Hagen was out front somewhere, so naturally I was up and heading the other direction. I was halfway out to the door out to the banks of a Honda Creek before I was even awake. As I dashed into the darkness, someone tossed me the mayonnaise jar with all the marijuana in it. Oh. Remember that? <laughs> I was expecting a raid we consolidated all the dope into one quart jar so it could be more easily disposed of in an emergency situation the one we are now apparently encountering. The jar was about two-thirds full. It was enough for two or three days. <laughs> I scrambled across the bed and started out the door, hoping to hustle a few yards down to the edge of the creek. And under cover of total darkness, you find at night deep in the redwood forest, tossed the stash as far as they could into the stream. 
Ooh. Hopefully, I was thinking as I stumbled toward the door, the mail jar would smash on some of the boulders in the creek and the evidence would be washed away down to the Pacific, a few miles down the Honda Road. The trouble was, as I scooted out the door, I ran straight into the barrel of an automatic pistol that was pointed directly at my forehead. <laughs> I could feel the gun at the bridge of my nose. It was cold, it was hard, it was scary. Stop or I'll shoot, the gunman shouted displaying an originality I thought as I turned back toward the way I would come. <laughs> <laughs> Foolhardily, I didn't believe he'd actually shoot me over something so benign as a little illegal weed. So I scampered back into the, into the room. I started to crawl across the bed, and he grabbed my ankle and started to crawl behind me. <laughs> I still had a mayonnaise jar in my hand. <laughs> Realizing the room was pitch black, I understood in this instant that he'd never be able to recognize me in the light. Uh -huh. On the other hand, of course, he could have shot me, so I kicked him in the chest and tried to break loose. Another prankster, Hagen, I believe, dashed into the bedroom, headed toward the door into the bathroom, which had two entrances, the other being off the kitchen. I lobbed a mayonnaise jar to Hagen and followed him into the john. What a sight. There was Keezy, who had been dabbing yet another touch of Dago, play, uh, Dago, Dago paint to the surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> to the constantly expanding mural montage that covered the walls, the porcelain, and even and every other surface of the bathroom. Only now he was busy with the more pressing business of flushing the grass down the toilet. The best foods jar was empty. At the same moment, a fat Asian man, who turned out to be the late federal agent Willie Wong, <laughs> ran into the bathroom from the kitchen, smacked Keezy's balding head with a huge flashlight, then jumped onto Keezy's back. <laughs> Keezy had been a championship wrestler during his college days at the University of Oregon. He was strong, agile, and just then, operating on adrenaline. He stood up from the swirling toilet, Agent Wong clinging to him. <laughs> With a terrific shrug, Keezy tossed the burly narc from his back onto Paige Browning, a.k.a. Des Prado, who was standing frozen at the sink where he had been shaving. <laughs> Somehow, despite the chaos going on around him, Paige was still applying the razor to his skin face. <laughs> Wong, armed with a huge ray of that flashlight, landed on Paige like a sumo wrestler as he was tossed from Keezy's back. The pair of them, Wong and Paige, tumbled into the bathtub. Paige still had the, held a Gillette razor in his hand. Suddenly the bathroom window was shattered by a huge automatic pistol thrust into the room in the grip of an anonymous but clearly law enforcement fist. You're under arrest, the gunman shouted from outside the bathroom window. Again, Agent Wong, who regained his footing, shouted that he was charging Paige and Keezy with resisting arrest. After Keezy and Paige were pulled to their feet, subdued and handcuffed, we were led at gunpoint into the living room. There were 14 of us, Keezy, Neil Cassidy, Paige Browning, Ken Babs, Gretchen Fetch and the Slime Queen, Hermit, Mountain Girl. Are you there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's amazing that uh, anybody can remember anything. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Hermit. Jerry Anderson, who's bride to be Sidney Tolley, sang with a band called The Matrix, soon to change its name to Jefferson Airplane. And Michael Hagen and a woman I was spending time with named Rosalie, three others, and me. We were handcuffed and charged with violating California's health and safety code, restrictions against the possession of illegal drugs, specifically cannabis sativa. They confiscated a jar filled with capsules of LSD straight from the ace ISIS master, Owsley Augustus Stanley. <laughs> but, it turned out, but it turned out the lysergic acid diethylamide was still legal in California and remained so for a couple of years. <laughs> there was, a, I mentioned here a debate that was going on. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but nobody knew what, uh, when LSD first became common in some circles. There wasn't a good uh, uh, nickname for it. Like it became acid, became the nickname. But there was a faction for a while wanted it named Alice. Remember? Casey wanted it to be called Alice. You know, he didn't oh. have someone, but it was an Alice D. Oh. <laughs> um, no, I skip ahead here. Okay, so after we after uh, after the arrest, we were taken down to the San Mateo County Jail, and we spent the night in jail. And uh, one of the th things that happened is that. 
Uh, I was in a cell with about five or six other pranksters and a murderer. And so the murderer had about two thirds of the cell to himself. <laughs> Squeezed over his front. The Honda bust was big news on the front pages of Bay Area newspapers. There followed a half dozen or more court appearances as our arraignment and preliminary hearing got underway in the old courthouse down at the San Mateo County seat in Redwood City. Sometimes we'd spend the whole day in court with lunch breaks at noon and marijuana breaks at mid-morning and mid-afternoon. <laughs> they weren't called pot breaks, they were officially called 10-minute recesses. And we didn't carry grass into the court with us where it might be found where they'd search folks entering the courtroom. We didn't even loop our stashes where they might have been found during a search of our cars. We might have been goofy, but we weren't stupid. <laughs> Instead of holding the weed in our pocket or our golf compartments, we chewed some gum when we made our first appearance before the judge and stuck it under the courtroom benches. <laughs> uh, the juicy fruit wads were still gooey and we fixed joints to the undersides of our seats so that we were always able to reach down and get something to smoke <laughs> when we exited the courtroom for lunch or recess. We never figured they'd search us when we left the courtroom. <laughs> This is when we were invited to, uh, Kesey was invited to speak to an Episcopalian <laughs> seminary in Marin County somewhere. Faye, Kesey, Ken Babs, and I sat in the front row just beneath the stage in the seminary's combination little theater and lecture room. Kesey was on stage right above us, yakking about whatever crossed his mind. He had a carafe uh, full of coffee at his side and a cup on a small table next to him. He asked the seminarians to interrupt him with questions whenever they felt like it. A student behind me toward the back asked, Mr. Kesey, what about grace? Can, what can you tell us about grace? Kesey began to talk about grace, but he was describing athletic grace, the grace of a basketball player. Oh. The sort of grace that is often thought of as being physical in nature, not the sort of grace in the minds of young seminarians. I could hear a sad gasp of embarrassment buzzing all about me. These seminarians, hoping for some deep sight about spiritual grace from the burly pothead author, <laughs> instead believed that Kesey had misunderstood them completely. They wanted to hear about the grace of God, not the grace of Will Chamberlain. <laughs> it seemed to many that Kesey had not only missed the point, but he was getting himself into a bind. <laughs> One of those situations where you start talking about something and get further and further away from the original topic and suddenly find yourself way out on a conversational limb with a chainsaw and no apparent way to stop calling yourself off. <laughs> no way to get yourself back toward the trunk. Fortunately, though, we knew the keys he was at his best when tap dancing on a tightrope or when sawing himself off when he was at the end of the limb. <laughs> But the seminarian, as well-mannered as such young men were expected to be, listened politely, even though their guest speaker was veering off on the subject. They watched as Kesey poured a cup of coffee and listened as he continued to discuss athletics in the, grace, the graceful way that athletes moved. Then he looked down at Ken Babs, who was sitting next to me. Hey, Babs, he asked, can I have the cream? Babs took a tiny pitcher of cream that was sitting next to him in a small bowl on a small table between our front row seats and the stage. He held a small cruet of cream by his handle and tossed it through the air. <laughs> Kesey, still talking, still declaiming on the grace of an athlete, hardly looking at Babs, caught the pitcher by its dainty handle. He poured a ball of cream into his cup and dropped the tiny pitcher back down to Babs, who also caught it by its handle and replaced the creamer effortlessly on the little table, right where it belonged next to the sugar bowl. <laughs> As he did this, Kesey was suggesting to the crowd, now wrapped in silent awe of their guest, <laughs> that the grace of an athlete and the grace of God are one and the same. Wow. They suspected that he was right, and so did I. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. The wedding gift. This is when I, I worked at Hustler Magazine, you know, where I started as a humorous humor writer and ended up as executive editor and uh, got fired three different times during the last time I just went somewhere else. Um, 
The first of J.R. one noticed upon entering Larry and Althea Flint's mansion, as they insisted we called their Bel Air home, was a statue of a youngish lad having sexual intercourse with a chicken. Oh. <laughs> this piece of sculpture stood in the foyer of the house, which was guarded in those days by two ferocious attack dogs and several ferocious and heavily armed attack men. <laughs> this is after he'd been shot. Larry proudly boasted that the artwork was a anatomy depiction of his first sexual experience. Uh, oh, no. oh, no. <laughs> Not that wondrous encounter that set the young Kentucky lad on the road to porn for aristocracy and been memorialized for the ages by this lovely piece of bronze. <laughs> Many years later, after Larry's assignation with the hen, when the house of editors who were then in Columbus, Ohio, learned that the boss was going to make an honest woman, or as honest a woman as possible, out of her his companion and hustler club Gucci Gucci Gitz, or Althea, top editor Bruce David came up with a perfect wedding gift for Larry. A live chicken in a box, a note reading in case things don't work out. <laughs> um, Bruce was a really brilliant guy, has had the worst temper I've ever encountered in my life. He was. Uh, uh, prone to screaming. One time he came down the aisle past my office door screaming and he was firing somebody down the hall in Arnold, an editor named Arnold. And he, it was embarrassing about everybody how mean Bruce was to this guy. And then, uh, two weeks later, uh, Bruce asked me if this guy Arnold, if I had was in touch with him and I could get a hold of him. And I said, yeah, I talked to him a couple of times. And he said, well, I'd like you to hire him back. I said, hire him back? Bruce, that was like the most awful firing I've ever seen, I've ever heard of. And Bruce said, yeah, but I want to hire him back so I can fire him again. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, knowing the story about Larry's first sexual encounter and wondering what to buy as a gift for the boss's upcoming nuptials, David ordered one of the hustler editors to go find a live chicken and buy it. The editor decided the easiest way to come up with a chicken on the hoof, so to speak, was to go directly to the source, a chicken ranch on the outskirts of Columbus. Michael, as the editor was named, got in his car and drove out through the Ohio countryside. When he got to the poultry ranch, he told me, he parked and walked over to an elderly man, the owner of the establishment, who was sitting in a rocking chair on the front porch of his rustic home. I'd like to purchase a chicken, he told the farmer. Well, Sonny, the man wondered, what do you want? Uh, roasting, frying, laying? <laughs> Fucking Michael. Oh, <laughs> uh, the farmer shrank back into his rocker in disgust. Well, the old coot told Michael, I ain't gonna help you to pick out a chicken to fuck. You go get one on your own. <laughs> he handed Michael a wooden crate, the kind of those thin slats that lettuce used to come in. Uh, Michael headed out into the huge flock of chickens and roamed and squawked and pecked at the ground and one after another just got offense apparently enough he found a chicken and he realized he had no idea what kind of chicken Bruce David might have had in mind as a potential sexual partner for her in case things don't work out but he finally picked out one bird apparently believed it looked sexy enough and with some death coaxing and shoving stuffed the bird into the crate paid the farmer a couple of bucks and tossed the box and bird into the back seat of his car Disaster struck as Michael headed back into Columbus. The chicken, which had been screeching and kicking and batting its wings against the side of the crate, suddenly cracked one of the slats and broke out of the box. As Michael tried to keep his car on the road, he began flying around the inside of the sedan. It was making a hell of a noise, Michael reported. And it was shitting air everywhere. It was like there was a shit and feather storm inside the car. It was a nightmare. <laughs> Trying to keep one hand in the steering wheel, Michael attempted to grab the bird and turn the other. He was on a busy highway and didn't want to risk pulling off the road with an enraged chicken winging its way around his head. It took a few miles and a lot of chicken chip, but he finally got a hand around the bird's neck. The chicken crapped on his lap. Enraged, Michael rolled down his window and tossed the screeching chicken out of the speeding car. 
Unfortunately for all involved, the hapless chicken smacked the windshield of an oncoming truck, <laughs> a big truck, an 18-wheeler. The bird splattered across the windshield in such a frightening and disgusting manner that the trucker, too, became enraged. He turned his Peterbilt around and began to follow Michael. Oh. <laughs> the very mayhem led the truck driver on a high-speed chase along the highway, then on less travel roads, then on municipal streets, and finally down alleyways and across front lawns and parking strips. He was sweating bullets. Finally, Michael realized he ditched the angry trucker. He heaved a sigh of relief and then realized he had uh, avoided one disaster to face another, the wrath of Bruce David, the editor unless he brought back a live chicken to the office. Reluctantly, he turned the car around and headed back to the country. <laughs> when he got to the poultry ranch, the farmer was still sitting on his rocking chair. <laughs> he looked at the forlorn young man standing in front of him, coated with chicken manure and assorted feathers. <laughs> Michael almost wept as he told the farmer, I need another chicken. <laughs> Excuse me, the farmer said, with a sort of abhorrence that only a chicken man could have for a city slicker pervert and buy a bird for his own sexual gratification. <laughs> what happened to the one I already sold you? <laughs> well, Michael replied timidly, a touch of shame in his voice. Something had happened. Bad, the old guy wondered. Yeah, bad, unfortunately. He killed it. Oh, sweet holy Jesus. <laughs> He looked at Michael and said, the apartment, that'll be another two bucks. <laughs> again from the bus to Kesey's. After Kesey and Paige were pulled to their feet subdued and handcuffed, we were led at gunpoint into the living room. Standing in Kesey's rustic living room, our hands cuffed behind us, most of us strangers to raids, search warrants, and cops in general. We were scared, of course, but somehow didn't believe we could face time behind bars for being in a house where marijuana had been found, even though I was pretty sure that Kesey had dumped the entire stash down the toilet. We had known, or suspecting at least, that the authorities were fixing to raid our little scene. Our motto had been, be prepared. Hmm. So when a squad of federal, state, and county narcs and deputies hurried across Kesey's uh, bridge armed with search warrants and automatic pistols on the night of April 23, 1965, we were ready, at least naive and simple pothead and acid heads that we were. We thought that we were ready. Fake Easy had gone over the place with a fine tooth comb before leaving with the three kids and the dogs. Faye vacuumed stray marijuana flakes from the rug. She had rounded up all the alligator clips and unistats and artistic squirking works devices. <laughs> Many designed by my friend John Sagan that might be considered uh, useful as roach clips. Not that we kept roaches. Their butts and their cigarettes around very long. We usually tossed them down like a vitamin pill when they got too short to burn. Ah, ah. Faye had uh, picked Aaron pot seeds from between floorboards on the floor. Another thing we did was put those joints in uh, little poke holes in the rolls of toilet paper and ah. soak like 18 roaches at once. <laughs> this is a disposal man. Um, we swallowed or smoked and got rid of the DMT, Opatrol, DET, Dexamil, Dolphine, Benny's, Sulfur's, Hashish, and other stimulants, depressants, and psychotropic, legal or otherwise, that she found around the place, except for the LSD in the refrigerator, and that was still legal. As far as I know, the only pot in the place was in my mayonnaise jar, and that had come from my cabin up the road when I was sent out on a so-called tether a couple of days earlier, and we ran out of the original stash. Under the watchful eyes of the deputies and narcotics agents who have set up shop on the huge round redwood slab dining room table on which we all carved our initials, I tried to act cool. I wasn't cool, of course, and sort of squeaked when they asked me my name and occupation. Like most of my fellow prisoners, I described myself as an employee of Intrepid Trips Incorporated. Uh -huh. Not mentioning that just a couple weeks earlier, after many months of life in Honda with PZ and the Franksters, I quit my job as a reporter in the San Mateo Times. I knew the managing editor down there was a guy who liked me and my politics and my lifestyle and my Honda friends. I knew he'd be tickled when he learned that I'd been busted for drugs. 
I was cuffed to Neil Cassidy and put into the back seat of a sheriff's squad car, along with Kesey, who was surprisingly quiet. In fact, we all seemed pretty reflective as we were rushed down to the county seat. We were facing time behind bars, especially Cassidy and another prankster who would be charged as three-time losers. An uh, old law, much like the present law, which is uh, you get busted three times and you're in for the rest of your life. When we were bailed out the next morning by our lawyers, Brian Rohan and Paul Robertson, who was on for his brother-in-law, at around 6 in the morning, the highlight of our release was Herman's mother-in-law confronting Kesey. A nurse at the same veterans hospital where Kesey worked when he got the idea for one flew over the cuckoo's nest, Herman's mom threw a copy of that same novel at his author's face. Go back to your cuckoo pad, she screamed at him. You should have stayed in the nest instead of flying over it, you big cuckoo. He definitely stands and looked out of the air, signed and handed it to one of the trailers and gratefully accepted the autograph <laughs> by the famous local writer. We now leave Lee's readings with Ken Kesey catching a pass of his own novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, as it was hurled at him outside the San Mateo County Courthouse. These intrepid trippers truly lived in their own great American novel. One of those was Leon Tabori, who was my friend for several years before his death in 2009. Visiting Leon, a World War II concentration camp survivor, former prison psychologist to Neil Cassidy, and founder of The Barn, a musical venue and tripping palace frequented by many bands and the late Janis Joplin, was my own guide to channel those days. Leon's bright eyes and optimistic grin belied years in prison, and I always donned my best colors for him. One day he told me the hitherto unknown story of the painting of Ken Kesey's infamous 1939 International Harvester school bus, the first magic bus. It was early 1964, and Kesey's gang sat outside his house in La Honda, mulling over a planned bus trip across the country to color up conformist America while making a movie and visiting the New York World's Fair and other places including Leary's gang at Millbrook. Leon was present when a young girl, someone's daughter, put her hand into an open bucket of blue house paint. She quickly withdrew it and started to cry, whereupon one of the pranksters advised, That's okay, darling. Just wipe it off. On the bus! Thereafter, the whole crew joined in the fun, all hands in buckets, smearing color all over the formerly yellow vehicle. And thus was born, purely by accident, the tradition of multicolored dream buses, and with it, later inspiration for day glow and rainbow tie-dye freak flags to fly so fervently in the 1960s and beyond. So that, dear friends, is my addition to the canon of the counterculture around these parts. Thanks, Leon. Join us next for John Leopold, First District Supervisor of the County of Santa Cruz, who, as you heard in the last podcast, brought the pranksters to Santa Cruz, read a proclamation and dedicated a memorial, appropriately a bus stop, to the 50th anniversary of the first acid test. John will introduce another colleague of mine in hip history, Nicholas Merriweather, archivist for the Grateful Dead collection at UC Santa Cruz. Nick will read for us a historian's view of the importance of the acid test, recounting the very words of beloved departed Jerry Garcia. After wrapping it up, John mentions the poster we all received that night, which you will find on the Levity Zone site and rocked us out with Grateful Dead cover band, Slugs and Roses. Find the poster, photos, video, and links to hip Santa Cruz history all at our site at www.levityzone.org. Tonight you're up here in Felton, but I want you to imagine that you're in SoCal, you're uh, near Dover Drive, across the street from uh, what you probably, what wasn't there then, but where we now think of as the Silver Spur, on, a, on a, a piece of land that there's one house and there's acres of open land. At that house uh, in 1965, Ken Babs 
and Lee Kornstrom and others lived there. And uh, there was a great place in downtown Santa Cruz called the Hip Pocket Bookstore. And that was the center, sort of the counterculture universe here in Santa Cruz. And, you know, I've talked now to a lot of people uh, who uh, were there, some people who said they were there, and, and, uh, and one thing's clear is that no one has the same memory about this event. Uh, that, so if you were there or not there, you, you get to help create the myth of what happened there 50 years ago. And uh, one thing, uh, in talking with uh, Ken over the, over the last couple of days, he said it's okay to make your own myth. So, uh, so tonight, you're part of an historic event, uh, celebrating an historic event, and you can make your own myth about what happened 50 years ago, or even what happened here this evening. <laughs> So, uh, but to, to do my part, because as a county supervisor, I'm supposed to be, you know, work on the facts. Uh, oh, yeah, no way. Uh, all right, I opened myself up for that. But let, let, uh, I want to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, who is Nicholas Merriweather, who's the archivist at the UC Santa Cruz Grateful Dead Archive uh, here in our community, and he actually knows the facts. So I'm going to have him come up and share what he knows about that evening. Thank you, John, and thank you all for coming out tonight. There are a number of people tonight whom we wish we were here to celebrate this remarkable event. Benkezi, Neil Cassidy, Peter Demma, many luminous souls whom we all miss. But there's one voice I would like to recall in my remarks, someone who always paid tribute to the acid test and whose 30-year career was an extended homage to them and what they signified. And that's Jerry Garcia. In interviews over the years, Jerry made it a point to say how much the acid test meant to him and his vision of what performance and communication and participation could mean. In one interview, he recalled that there were always magical things happening at the acid test. Truly amazing. That was the acid test, and the acid test was the prototype for our whole basic trip. But nothing has ever come up to the level of the way the acid test was. It just was never equaled. As for why, he explained that truly it was magical because there was that willingness for everybody to be constantly on the lookout for something new. And Jerry, along with everyone else there, immediately got it. As he put it, when the acid tests were going on, everybody knew that it was far out. Everyone knew that it was at least cosmic. Whether it was or was not is not even important, but we were definitely all together in that. We all found ourselves into it. And what that it was, was nothing less than an epiphany. The acid test was our first exposure to formlessness. Formlessness and chaos lead to new forms, new order, closer to probably what the real order is. When you break the old orders, and the old forms and leave them broken and shattered, you suddenly find yourself into a new space with new form and new order, which are more likely the way it is. But perhaps the most revealing comment comes from a conversation he had with writer Michael Leiden. There were no sets. We would just do however it would happen. It wasn't a gig. It was the acid test where anything was okay. Thousands of people, man, all helplessly stoned, all finding themselves in a room full of other thousands of people, none of whom any of them were afraid of. It was magic, far out, beautiful magic. That is the cultural legacy and significance of the acid test. The idea, the ideal, gathering together, dropping all pretenses, abandoning all fear, and simply celebrating. That is something rare and precious and vital. Humanity has always needed that, and we need that today, now more than ever. Honoring that ideal and vision is what we're doing with this historical marker and occasion. Thanks to John Leopold, the Merry Pranksters, and all of you, we are all part of the process, shepherding the counterculture into culture, and making sure those lessons and that ideal are not forgotten. Thanks for coming.
job, Rob. <laughs> Uh, there's a couple people who helped uh, make uh, this evening happen, and there's a, a couple people I just want to recognize. You know, a little over a year ago, I, I was at a meeting of the Central Coast Alliance for Health, which is the largest Medi-Cal insurance provider uh, in the Tri-County area. It, it has 300,000 members in Santa Cruz, Monterey, and Merced County. And I get to serve with a lot of uh, great people on that board. One is the head of Sutter Hospital, uh, at, at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. And he came to me in August uh, of uh, last year and he said, hey, the 50th anniversary of the first acid test happened in your district. What are you gonna do about it? <laughs> so I wanna encourage you to always talk to your elected officials and ask them what the hell are you gonna do about it? Because sometimes we actually do something. <laughs> You'll get to hear from Slugs and Roses in just a minute, and I hope you'll say and dance really hard on that. And then lastly, uh, when you leave here tonight, you'll, you'll get a poster, a free poster, a poster designed by Gary Houston. And uh, it was uh, Roger McNamee uh, with Moon Alice. Uh, I reached out to him and he said, how do I get involved? And I said, can you produce a poster? And he made it happen, and you'll get a chance to take that home this evening. So let's thank Roger, too. Yeah.